Roebuck Carter, and I'm the Senior Vice President at the Mann Center for the Performing Arts for Institutional Advancement. The Mann is so pleased to be a convener of this incredibly important conversation, hand in hand with our sponsor, Nemours Children's Hospital. We seek to remain connected with our audience, you, our audience, in the and the entire Philadelphia community. And now with our summer season recently officially suspended due to COVID-19, we have, like the rest of the world, found new ways to communicate. And virally is the way that we're doing it right now, virtually. The man has a wonderful and long-standing relationship with our neighbors in West Philadelphia, particularly the Parkside community, which has been doubly impacted, like so many other communities throughout this area and throughout the country, because of first COVID-19, and also the looting that ravaged important businesses for this community. Um, today, we are talking about how to talk about the issue of racism um, against black people in this country to our children. Um, it, we have all seen the devastating, tragic videos that have hit the news throughout the country and throughout the world. And we have all seen in a positive way, perhaps the protests that have taken place because of that. And so this conversation is unavoidable and maybe that's a good thing. So we are really, really excited to be a part of this conversation. We don't profess to, you know, to change the world in terms of all that's going on, but we can do our part and that's what feels good right now. So um, thank you for being a part of this. Um, and I would like to introduce Michelle Shorter from Nemours Hospital. Hello, um, thanks Joan. I am Michelle Shorter and I sit in external affairs at Nemours Children's Hospital as the director for community engagement. And I am so excited about this opportunity to connect with my friends over at the Mann Center to facilitate such an important conversation for parents and children. Um, on this very day in 1865, um, the last remaining slaves in our country were freed. Um, they were in Texas. Um, and interestingly, interestingly, you fast forward to 2020, and we're now discussing the long-term impacts of slavery, which is racism. Um, I just wonder, should we consider that a fundamental way to change our culture um, is similar to how we have tried to address the COVID pa pandemic? So what did we do? We tried to stop the spread. And I think hopefully tonight, you know, when you hear from our experts, um, they will provide tools for you um, that will help us have conversations with our children because they are our next generation of parents and leaders. Um, so how do we stop the spread? Um, I do know at Nemours, we're committed to keeping children healthy. Um, the psychological and emotional impacts of racism are real. Um, we acknowledge the grief, the fear and the curiosity that children have, their questions are not taboo. Um, it's a reflection of genuine, um, it's a genuine response to what they're seeing and hearing from adults. So we're here because we're fulfilling our promise to patients, families, and communities through partnerships like this. Um, like Joan said, to do our part um, with stopping spread. So at such a critical time in our country, what do we say to our kids? Um, how do we stop the spread of hate, pain, and fear? Um, tonight, we are going to listen to parents, teenagers, and children. Um, we welcome you to take this moment to listen with your minds and your hearts. Um, we are honored that we have this opportunity to share this moment with you and your families. And we're here to support children through this conversation. Um, at Nemours, we say that your child is our promise. So um, I am also very excited and appreciative to have Dr. Waller here to contribute to this conversation. Um, pastor Waller is the senior pastor of Enon Tabernacle Baptist Church, which is the largest church in Pennsylvania. Um, under his leadership, the church has actually expanded its influence and visibility in the Philadelphia community regarding issues just like this, um, things that impact the black community. So, you know, according to Pastor Waller, Enon is unapologetically youth oriented, which is exactly why he's such a great contributor for this conversation. Um, they understand that today's youth are our leaders of tomorrow. So Pastor Waller, I'm going to hand this over to you for opening comments. All right, well, thank you so much. And I wanna thank the Man Center for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. And I'm excited because we're talking about what about the children? So I'd like to put this conversation in context and share a story of my own journey. Um, it's September of 1967 and I'm, I have this picture it's me sitting on Martin Luther King's lap. 
Martin Luther King was my father's friend. He was preaching for my father. And so they took this picture of me sitting on his lap. I've always had this picture. I've had it since that day. It's either been in my bedroom, my dorm room, or my office. Well, on April 4th in 1968, I was just getting ready to be four years old. I remember that day. The reason I remember it is because the man on my wall, I was seeing him on TV because he was assassinated. He was shot. But what I remember more is being in my kitchen, watching my dad, the biggest man in my life, hold my mother and cry. I was scared. I didn't know what was going on. I mean, I didn't understand everything that was happening. I knew that the man who I took the picture with, who was on the television, who was on my picture, had been shot. And I knew it scared my father. And because it scared my father, it scared me. I was four years old. I was trying to make sense out of everything that was going on. At that same time, my older brother was going to Columbia University and he went to, he went to jail because he was fighting for African-Americans to have more uh, African heritage uh, teaching in college. A lot was going on, but I was four years old. It was really important for me, for my parents to help break that down for me, to help talk to me in terms that helped me get over my fear because I really was afraid. A lot of that fear came from not really understanding how to talk about it, not knowing what to think, because if anything could make my father cry, it could sure get me. We recognize that while we as adults wrestle with all of this stuff, with police and with racism, we recognize that our cognitive ability may not be the same as our children, and what we are thinking of as normative may not be normative for them. And so this evening, we want to talk to you about how we can have these complex conversations with our children. I'm grateful because my mother and father helped me to understand that no matter how scared I was, they were going to work to make a better world. And so the world for me in 1968 was a very challenging time, but it set the trajectory for me to make a difference in the world now in 2020. We want to do that same thing for you for your parents, and for all who are part of this conversation. We believe, I believe, it's a very exciting time to be a human being, because if I were in church, I would say when the world is at its worst, that's when God is at his best. And so I believe that out of all of this stuff, we're going to build a whole brand new world, and you as young people are going to be a part of it. So we're going to talk, and a lot of people who are smarter than I am are getting ready to talk to you about ways that we can have this conversation. And so I'm just grateful to be a part. So let's start having this conversation. Rachel? Thank you so much, Pastor Waller. Those were inspiring words and a great way for us to uh, come together and have this conversation. And um, I, uh, my name is Rachel Salas Silverman, and I am the director of Enterprise Public Relations for the Nemours Children's Health System. And I'm so pleased to be with uh, you tonight or today because uh, we have some experts who are going to come together and talk about this. And I would like to just take a moment to introduce them to you. So first, we have Dr. Megan Walls. She's a pediatric psychologist at AI DuPont uh, Hospital for Children. She holds an appointment as Assistant Clinical Professor of Pediatrics with the Sydney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University. Dr. Walls it practices an integrated primary care at Nemours DuPont Pediatrics at Jessup Street office in Wilmington. And she also works on the behavioral health policy in Delaware. So welcome Dr. Walls. We also have Dr. Roger Harrison, and he's the faculty member of the Division of Behavioral Health at Nemours AI DuPont Hospital for Children. In his role, he trains psychology graduate students, residents, and fellows, and serves families through Nemours Integrated Primary Care Clinics. Dr. Harrison is actively involved in diversity work at the local and state levels, and serves as a co-chair of the Division of Behavioral Health's Diversity Subcommittee, and as chair of the Delaware Psychological Association's Diversity Committee. We also have with us today, Dr. Danica Perry. Dr. Perry joined the Division of Psychology at Nemours in 2015 and provides behavioral health consultation to her physician colleagues and evidence-based care to children and families in rural Delaware. Her clinical areas of interest include culturally responsive treatment, training and supervision, trauma-informed care, quality improvement, 
health disparities, and health equity. She currently serves as the, as the diversity and inclusion advisor for the Division of Psychology and leads diversity pipeline development for the division through her work on the diversity clinic. And so those are our three experts today, but joining them, of course, is Dr. Uh, Pastor Waller. Um, and so he's a doctor and a pastor, which is wonderful in terms of our conversation today. And I also um, want to introduce everyone to Naomi Gonzalez. Naomi is the Vice President of Education and Community Engagement for the Mann Center, and her role is to build impactful and engaging programs that span arts education to community building initiatives that serve the West Parkside neighborhood and the city of Philadelphia. So we have a great panel, and uh, as is discussed earlier, we have some uh, really important questions that uh, kids in our community and their families have asked us. And so I'd like to invite us to watch the first question by video, and then we'll have Dr. Perry uh, answer this first question for us. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to address the panel uh, with regards to racism and how we address and speak to our children. I guess my question would be, uh, be as though trauma and uh, racism is not one of the aces uh, in terms of overall trauma for students that identify early enough will be able to help us support their, their growth. What effect does racism actually have since it hasn't been quantified in one of those aces or one of those categories? Will it have everlasting effects and cause alcoholism or, or drug abuse? I'd be interested to know that. Thank you so very much for your question. It's such a thought provoking question and a question that many public health scholars are examining and um, exploring today. And I understand that you are a principal, so it's so nice to have your perspective um, as I'm sure you are interacting with young people every day. Before I dive into some of my thoughts about your question, I'd like to give a brief overview of the ACEs. So the ACEs, that stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, and these experiences can be categorized into three groups one being abuse, neglect, or childhood dysfunction in the family. And so what that study has found is that children who have experienced one or more ACEs are at greater risk of developing um, a significant physical health concern, as well as other concerns, such as mental illness, substance misuse, um, and it could affect their overall livelihood. So back to your question, which is, how does racism have an impact on children in addition to the ACEs? I think it has a compounding impact. And I actually believe that racism should be quantified and it should be considered one of the categories um, under ACEs. If we think about it, racism that is experienced by black and brown communities results in stress. Our children are experiencing discrimination. They are being left out of opportunities. They're being um, prevented from opportunities of achieving. They don't have the same access um, even to food. Um, in some of our communities. And so if you think about some of those stressors, which we call racialized, racialized stress, you can only imagine how much more that compounds um, the stress that a child may experience every day. And then think about vicarious trauma, which has to do with watching events in your community, watching senseless, brutal killings of black and brown people on TV or experiencing it on your block and wondering, you know, am I gonna hear gunshots tonight? Am I gonna be safe tonight, right? All of that compounds all of these additional events that children may experience from zero to 17. Thank you very much, Dr. Perry. Um, Dr. Harrison, did you want to uh, add any comments? 
Sure, I agree wholeheartedly with everything that Dr. Perry said. And when I try to think about the, the, the impact of racism as an ACE, I think public health officials often look at three things and all of these three things are really significantly impacted by racism. So public health officials like to look at things like length of life, how long do we live? And we know that racism actually leads to shorter length of life. Um, public health officials look at our overall health and our well-being, and we know that racism increases the likelihood that people who experience racism are going to have poorer health from our heart health to our respiratory health uh, to our mental health to make us more prone to even develop like certain kinds of like cancers. We know that racism makes, makes healing from disease harder. And so when we look at the length of life, when we look at the health in life, and we look at the overall joy that we experience in life, which is a really important indicator of the quality of our life, we know that racism decreases the joy that we experience in our life for all of the reasons that Dr. Perry spoke of. And so absolutely, beginning in early childhood, I would agree that racism is an ace. It is an adverse childhood experience because people who experience it, they, we, we live with that experience of knowing that it leads to a shortened life, more prone to disease, tougher healing when we experience sickness, and it just robs us of the joy in our lives based on the color of our skin in the society that we live. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for your, uh, for your great comments. Um, we'll now move to our second question, and then Dr. Harrison, uh, feel free to jump in with your thoughts on it after the video is finished. Hello, my name is Lakeisha, and this is Delila Dean. All right, and um, Delila, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Are you curious about things that are going on lately in the world, well, especially with black people? Yes, I'm curious because I really don't know why the black people don't, I mean the white people don't like our skin. Hmm. I have that same curiosity, Delila. Delila and mom, the first thing I want to say, Delila, as a girl dad, as a father of three beautiful brown skin girls, that I love the color of your skin. And you are such a beautiful brown skin girl. But you ask a powerful question. You ask a question, Delila, that makes my heart break. Um, you ask like, what is it that they don't like about the color of my skin? And to answer that question, I'm going to say that there really are two reasons uh, why this is the state of things in, in our world today, in our country. The first being um, education, what people have learned. And the second being miseducation, what people have not learned. And when we talk about education, Delita, what I mean is, um, not just the things that we learn in school when we go to school, because we're learning things every day. Sometimes we learn things just because things get paired together and things get associated. For example, if I said peanut butter and, no one had to teach you that the answer to that question is jelly. And if I said anything else, you'd be like, mm, I'm not really sure that you're right because we've come to associate peanut butter and jelly if you want a really good sandwich. But sadly, in our country, um, people have learned through ways that we're educated as a society that black and bad go together, or black and unsafe go together, or black and dangerous go together, and black and scary go together, and black and all of the bad things go together. And so when people see a black cat, even people are like, whoa, you don't want to run into a black cat. Um, and we've also learned that white is good and white is safe. And so we have angel food cake, which is a very light cake, but you know, devil's cake is the brown cake. And so uh, part of it, Delila, is that we've just learned so many things in our society 
that have come to associate it, your beautiful brown skin with a lot of bad things, while people with have white skin get associated with a lot of good things. And that's the piece that I mean, education. We're not necessarily taught that in school, but it's taught everywhere. It's taught on TV when we turn the TV on and we see the stories about black people. It's taught in movies when we look at the characters that get developed in movies and who black people get the roles that they play in movies. And so the first thing is education, Dalila. The second thing is miseducation. Um, and by miseducation, I mean there are powerful stories about how well, white people um, came to think of black people this way um, that are never taught in school. Um, and they're never taught in schools because unfortunately in the country that we live, a lot of the people who created the curriculum, a lot of the people who write the textbooks, a lot of the people who decide what we get to learn as students in school, decided that it was not important to teach our children about the history of race and about the history about how black people um, became thought of as less than, more dangerous than, inferior to, um, more unsafe um, compared to white people. And so this combination of education and miseducation leads lots of white people today to associate black with dangerous or unsafe, um, just the way that you would associate peanut butter with jelly. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. You've uh, provided some really, really interesting comments and very thoughtful. Um, I just, uh, before we move on to the next question, I do want to invite Dr. Walls um, to say uh, a few thoughts as well um, before we move on. Dr. Walls. Thank you. Um, I will. I will say I am super lucky because I get to listen to Dr. Harrison and Dr. Perry speak a lot on these topics, and I'm learning constantly. Um, and one of the things that I think that also happens in white families is that we think of things as it's better to be colorblind and not talk about color. And so then when our kids have these questions, we don't talk about them and we don't answer them. And that feeds back into what Dr. Harrison is saying, right? So instead of parents saying black is not equated to bad, and in fact, let's have diverse friendships and let's talk about how to respect people and how to stand up for people even when it's hard, they just don't talk about it at all. And so instead of helping to be a part of the solution, I think sometimes what happens is we just aren't going to talk about it. And I think that really feeds into the problem. And, you know, we're, we're sort of comfortable with the peanut butter and jelly. And we don't try to move on from that to think, okay, maybe there are some other ways that we can really address this and think about this. And so I think when I think about what else is contributing, I think comfort and um, the perhaps not unwillingness, but to, to Dr. Harrison's point, the not wanting to educate and not wanting to take the time to do those things can also feed in. Hey Rachel, it's Michelle. I just wanted to uh, make one note about something that I heard her say. As a Black woman, I wanted to also re-emphasize that she is beautiful um, because one thing that I think we also learn is that while white is also equated to good and safe, as brown girls for us, we see that white is also prettier. And I think it is very important for that little girl who is probably one of the most adorable babies I've ever seen to know that you are absolutely beautiful. Um, and I think that is something else that we can do a great job of as adults to make sure that we are re-emphasizing for these girls and their self-esteem and their self-confidence um, that they are just as beautiful as anyone regardless of the hue of their skin. Thank you, Michelle. So, such a great point. Um, and now we're uh, on that, we're gonna move on to our next question um, and we're gonna see our, our next video. My question is, how do you suggest people cope with all the situations that's been going on in the world? I know for me personally, I've been feeling a bit unsettled and I know meditation has helped me um, calm my nerves. I'm wondering if you have any other suggestions. Dr. Walls, would you be able to start us off in uh, some advice here? Sure. So, you know, I, I think 
what we're hearing this teenager say is what we're hearing a lot of folks say, which is that a lot of these recent events are really stressful. Um, racism isn't new, but this influx of videos and media and, um, you know, things like having videos of people actually being physical, har physically harmed or killed are a little bit new. And so certainly it makes sense to feel unsettled. And I think feeling unsettled probably looks different for teens who are black or teens of color than white teens. And I don't pretend to know or understand what our, our kiddos are feeling, especially our black teenagers right now. But I, I do think we need to think about the fact that these issues as they become more prevalent and they're in front of them all day every day not just their personal experience anymore but sort of everyone's experience that i expect that stress to look a little bit different and and sometimes even a little bit traumatic i do just want to comment i heard pastor waller say and i loved this you said um we need to build a brand new world and when I think about what that means for our perhaps white teenagers who are feeling this, I think I want some of that unsettledness to be okay. I want us to say, you have to feel unsettled to have a, to have a, a brand new world. Things don't change by us all kind of sitting where we are and not making any efforts. And so I think addressing, you know, for teens who are listening and their parents, it's okay in your homes right now if white families are feeling that discomfort and that we need to sit with that and we need to do some education ourselves and some learning. Um, but I think when I go back to this concept of what can we do, right? As psychologists, we know that stress, whether it's acute stress, right? So some of these things that are happening currently with protests and killings are, are more of this acute stress or whether it's long-term stress, things like Dr. Perry talked about with racism constantly being a piece of life we know that we have to help people figure out how to cope. So the first piece of it is give yourself permission to feel. It's okay to feel these feelings. I expect anger and sadness and unrest and anxiety. And those things are things we have to say to our kids. If you're a parent listening or if you're a teenager to yourself, all right, I'm allowed to feel this way. This is okay. I think so often the messages sent are push that away. Just, just don't think about it. And and so second, I think we talk about as psychologists, what do we do to help teenagers cope? Um, some of the things that we all do in our practice are help teenagers figure out what to do to cope in the moment. So things like diaphragmatic breathing, right? Where if we have a moment where people are feeling really stressed, we teach them how to do three seconds slow breathing in, three seconds slow breathing out. And what we know is that that actually helps kids physically. It lowers their heart rate. It makes them feel calmer and less panicked. And while I don't I don't uh, in any way suggest that that settles some of this larger unsettled feeling. I do think we need to give kids and teens some things to help them get through this. Um, other things are things like guided imagery or meditation. Like, um, you know, our young woman just asked in this question said that's been something that helps for her. Those are great techniques. The, the sort of last piece I'll say is um, you know, I work in a clinic in Wilmington, Delaware, where most of my teenage patients are black. And a lot of what they've been saying to me is my stress is so high right now because of some of these things. So I also want families and teenagers to feel like, you know what, there's nothing wrong with you. And it's not a mental health problem you have, but if your stress is so high that you can't sleep or you can't eat or you don't wanna get out of bed and talk to your friends, please reach out, whether that's to your pediatrician or behavioral health provider. Um, but again, I wanna send that message. It doesn't mean that it's something wrong with you. It means the situation is really stressful. And I think if we can encourage teens and families to sit with how they're feeling and be okay with unsettled, but then also do something if they need some help coping, that's the best way we can help our teens and our families. Thank you so much. I think you gave us some really good tips, not just for teenagers, but for all of us when we're stressed. And, um, and yes, to echo that point, if you're feeling like you can't navigate this alone, that there is help available. Um, so we're gonna move on to our next question. And this is um, going to be for Pastor Waller. And so this is a mom and her son of eight years old. So after the video, Pastor Waller, you're welcome to, uh, to share your thoughts. Hello, so I'm here with my eight-year-old, and we're going to talk about a very interesting conversation we had at dinner today. Super interesting. So what question did you have at dinner? 
Where's Joseph from the Bible really white? And why did you think Joseph was white? Because basically all the pictures in the Bible of people, they were all white. And what did I tell you about that? That that's not true because people from that place were of color. So what's your ultimate question then? Why would white people change the Bible? Wow. Thank you, man. I appreciate that question. And, you know, a whole lot of people have been asking that question. And you are right. The people of the Bible look like you and me. Um, you can, and, and I don't want to get too far in the weeds on this, but um, Joseph and the Egyptians, you know, there was, there was a historian, his name was Herodotus, and he taught and wrote about the color of the Egyptians. And the color of the Egyptians, he said that they were dark skinned with woolly hair. And it's in that context that we meet all of these biblical characters, Joseph and, and Abraham and Moses. And so it is clear uh, that the people of the Bible look more like you and like me than the people who wrote books about the Bible. You see, there's the Bible and then there are books about the Bible. And the people who wrote the books about the Bible chose to draw pictures about the people in the Bible to make them look like the people who wrote the book, but not people in the book. So the reality is you are already ahead of the game because you recognize that where the people are from in that area of Africa were people that look like me and you. Now, the people who wrote books about the book uh, tend not to look like me and you. And so they made the pictures of the people in the book look like people who wrote the books about the book. So, um, but I want to thank you for that. And you know what? You are the right age um, to discover that truth. Um, and I am so excited about you. We have a ministry for young boys between the ages of seven and nine, because what happens at what happens in this world right now, you're probably beginning to get a whole lot of messages about the fact that you are black and that you are male and that you are not preferred. And our ministry for young boys, your age between seven and nine is called Young Abrahams, because what I want you to know, and you've just demonstrated it, that you are one of the most fantastic people on the planet. And no matter what you are being told by the images on the screen or the books that Pete written by people. Um, the truth is you were wondrously and marvelously made in the image of God, just like people in the real book. And so I'm excited that you discovered that. I'm excited that you know that. And the real problem is not with the book. It's with the people who wrote the books about the book. Thank you, Pastor Waller. That, I have a follow-up question for you. Yes. So how does this ultimately affect black or brown children when they learn that their skin color has been maybe erased or modified in some religious doctrines? Yeah, it, it, it makes it a difficult conversation. And I know we I find with teenagers, um, as they are discovering truth and discovering the hypocrisy in a lot of our religious dogma, it makes it difficult to have a conversation about God. Um, and because if, if you've been lying to me about other things, why should I believe you about this? And so what we can do is do what I, what I tried to do in that moment is acknowledge the truth. Uh, I tried to say it in a simple way, but I tried to say to him, you're right, people have messed it up and people have told us wrong and I'm not gonna whitewash that uh, and I'm not going to gloss over that you discovered truth within the context of a lie and I'm gonna celebrate you for that. And now maybe you'll trust me to tell you that beyond the hypocrisy of all of this, there still is something very real, which I believe, and that is a God who created us all. Um, and so I believe, you know, I think you all know, when a child is able to formulate the question, they're ready for the real answer. Uh, and so, um, I think when they're brave enough to press us with the question, come at them with the truth and gain honesty points and integrity points so we can then tell them the truth. Thank you. That was so, so, so well done. Thank you. Um, we are going to move on to our next question. And this is from a mother in Philadelphia. 
Hi, thank you so much for answering our questions. Uh, so many of us have the um, same problem, and uh, one of them is, how can families protect their children from anxiety when they've been hearing explosions at night, helicopters during the day, and they're hearing or overhearing that people they know have been tear gassed by the police? Um, how do we protect their childhoods from being swamped by anxiety? Um, and how do we protect them from taking on the problems that have been mishandled and created by our leaders? How do we socialize our children in times of isolation? I really appreciate uh, any advice you can give me as um, a mom of a 12-year-old who's having trouble sleeping at night. Thanks so much. Dr. Walls, do you want to take that one? Sure. So, you know, I, I think certainly this is something we need to talk about a bit because there are things going on in our neighborhoods. And certainly it sounds like for this mom, her, her kiddos hearing certain things and seeing certain things. You know, in the practice of psychology, we talk a lot about anxiety and our guiding principle is avoidance makes anxiety worse. And, and I'll clarify that, which that doesn't mean kids need every detail of everything. But I think sometimes when we aim to protect our kids, what we're actually doing is the opposite of what Pastor Waller just said. When they're old enough to ask the questions and they're old enough to know what's going on, we sort of owe them a conversation. Um, I think part of that means that we have to ask our kids what they are hearing and what they are thinking. And um, I appreciate this mom's question about sleep and, and I'll comment on that too, but we need to really understand where our kids are. What is the thing that's bothering them? What is their question, right? Is there a question behind their concerns? And give developmentally appropriate answers that, that can help get through that. And to also, you know, sort of again, address this piece of, Avoiding this has never helped before. Avoiding talking about these things has not helped. I'll be honest, I'm working with my kids on us having real conversations. White families have historically not had these conversations. And so we have a history of avoiding them. And when we avoid them, we can't solve the problem. And so I think part of this is thinking a little bit about as parents, is part of it our discomfort? Is part of it that if we talk about this, this is real. And I think that's especially true for white families right now. And, and that's not to say, again, we have to give kids every detail, right? So I do think we also owe it to our children to watch what they're watching and seeing. And if it's too much for any of our kids, right? Limiting social media, limiting media, doing those things. But I, I, hesitant, I hesitate at the idea of protecting them from anything going on, because I think that's what has led us to part of this problem. And secondarily, we know, research tells us that kids know what's going on much before parents and teachers often think they do. So when we blow it off, we're doing them a disservice because we're not having those, those honest conversations. So I think we really need to think about that, combined with how do we give our kids breaks? How do we make sure that perhaps they're safely engaging. This mom mentioned social interactions, right? So how do we make sure they're doing things like FaceTiming with their friends, talking to their friends? We might have to be a little bit more flexible on screen time if the mix of COVID and what's going on in the neighborhoods mean kids can't get outside right now and be with their friends. I think the fear is a really a very real thing. Um, and the last thing I'll sort of say on this is that uh, this mom mentioned not being able to sleep. Some of the coping skills I mentioned earlier are great for some of those things too. So in the moment, let's get your kid to sleep. But again, I think both from a psychological standpoint of anxiety, but a historical standpoint of sort of avoidance of these topics, if we can address them and talk to our kids and have honest conversations and give honest but brief answers, we're actually going to help them more in the long term. And now we're going to move on to our next question uh, with a, from a mother uh, in Philadelphia. I understand uh, the executive uh, component of organizations and also being a parent out here on the ground. I serve as a community uh, committee woman in my community that I live in. So everyone knows I love the kids like I love children. My question to you, um, 
as your organization, how do you educate a parent to teach a child about racism? How do you get them to understand that because of the color of their skin that they are different and they will not be looked as an e looked on upon as an equal? Dr. Perry, would you like to uh, to share with us your thoughts on that? I would love to to respond to that question and. I'm so thankful to know that our young people have someone like you um, who they can see actively working in the community, connecting to, to them at their level, um, thinking about the things that they're thinking about and a beautiful brown woman as yourself. So thank you for that. Um, I wanna respond first by sharing a little adage that I grew up with. And that adage was, children learn but they live. I can vividly see that um, adage hanging on my wall. Um, and I would often read it as a, as a little girl. And so to your question, um, how, how is racism taught in so many ways? And um, our panelists have spoken to that. Dr. Harrison talked about the association or um, the way that we use certain words to associate with the color, with color black and brown versus how the words that we associate with uh, the color white. So association is, is one way and that's a larger societal force. Another form is through our everyday actions. So as parents, who do we consider our friends? Who are the people that we allow to come into our homes for baby showers and family gatherings? Who are the people that our children see us interacting with? What do they hear us say about people of color or people who are white? Um, racism is also taught by not preventing situations where people of color are treated unjustly because of the color of their skin, right? So I talked a little bit earlier about children being prevented from certain opportunities or a child being the only person of color, you know, on a swim team, something like that. How do we come along and support that child, right? Or how do we leave that child to feel isolated? Those are some of the, what we call kind of, kind of silent ways of, of teaching racism and allowing racism to continue. There are some more overt or direct ways that racism is taught, you know, especially when, you know, we use derogatory terms about people of color when we tell our children not to associate or play with those black and brown kids, don't go over there, don't hang around their house, those types of, that type of language definitely um, contributes to racism. Um, we have two more questions. Um, so the next one um, is from Sophie, who is 10 years old. And um, Naomi, our, um, from the man, is going to be uh, providing some insight for us on this one. I'm Sophie and I'm 10. Do people who are being hurt need hugs? And do the people who are hurting people, do they also need hugs? Because feels like they do. Hi, Sophie. And the answer, the very basic answer, I would say is yes. Um, and I read that in two different ways. Uh, on one side, I'm hearing, do people need love? And yes, people who are being hurt need love, and people who are hurting other people need love. But I'm going to speak to my experience as an educator. And there were words that were spoken by this fantastic panel, like by Dr. Harrison saying, miseducation in education. And a lot of the work that I do is bringing culturally relevant arts out into the city, exposing children to music from India and Africa and Latin America. It's important that kids at a young age 
feel what it is to be in another culture, whether it's through the arts or through, um, through just learning about other cultures. And there's a very good chance that, again, that miseducation point, you know, if those kids had been exposed or had learned about other people at the right age and that we're all different and they're all different kinds of colors, then there wouldn't be the need to ask if people need hugs. <laughs> um, and this also goes to, um, you know, Dr. Perry's comment on the diversity of the dolls or the toys. Again, you know, in our education, it's really important to immerse children into who Philadelphia is. Philadelphia is a melting pot. We have neighborhoods from Ethiopia, from Vietnam, from all over. And children need to know that and feel that and know what that means. So the quick answer is yes, they need the hugs. Um, but the longer answer, it really has to do with um, educating and just seeing the world, just opening your lens and seeing it from other perspectives. And I would really, really love um, to ask uh, the pastor if he had any comments on this question as well. Yeah, I um, and thank you for that. Um, I I really believe that that of course everybody needs love and everybody because hurt people hurt people, and so we're, we're very clear that the people who are hurt need hugs and people who are doing the hurting need hugs and and so it's our responsibility to model that behavior uh particularly those of us who are adults um we're, we're going to we we can tell our children a lot of words and we can tell them how to get along but until they see us doing it um they're just not going to do it and that means we're we're going to have to make sure as adults we pass on our passion but not our prejudice I am a 56-year-old Black man from the Midwest. I have some thoughts about how Black and white do and don't get along. And I need to be real careful that I don't let my 56 years define the next 56 for the next generation. And so I want to pass on the truth of my experience um, without passing on the prejudice of my experience. Um, and so that, that, that's one piece. But I also believe that we have to, uh, there's a big word, um, young people, it's called xenophobia. I'm just afraid of what I just don't understand. I'm just afraid of what's over there. And what I believe um, is that when I'm afraid of what I don't know and I'm afraid of over there, that fear really comes out of not being secure where I am. And what we can do to help our children, what we can do is really help them get secure in who they are. Um, I'm not going to be able to teach you everything about everybody else, but I sure can teach you and help you to appreciate who you are and who, uh, who I am as your father. I'm a girl dad too. And so I, I raised my children uh, and they went to predominantly white schools too. And I know what that looks like. And I know the difference between my daughter's school when they, the year Obama became the president and the year the Phillies won the World Series. It was the same same semester. And my daughter's school reacted to the Phillies much differently than they reacted to Obama's win. And when the little black girls in that school wanted to do what the other little girls did when the Phillies won and the administration didn't let it happen, I was the first black parent up there calling the school on it because that's what my daughters needed in that moment. What my daughters needed was to see their dad step in and be dad and affirm them in their moment and their pain. I think it's those things. I may not be able to tell them all of the history, but I can tell them that I'm here in this moment. Uh, and that's what uh, our children need uh, if they're going to get comfortable and be able to move past this season. Thank you. And, uh, and we are all here in this moment together talking about this. So um, Pastor Waller, you as always bring up some really uh, incredible perspective. Um, we do have our last question for our gathering today. And, um, and I'm going to ask Dr. Harrison to, uh, to provide the comment after this video of a mom and, uh, with three boys. As a black mother with three black boys, I had to have a talk with them about what's going on today. And one of my sons asked me, when people are racist, 
is it because they are afraid of us or because they think they're better than us? Wow. So I, I wanted to start by saying something, something happened in my stomach when you started your question by saying I'm the black mother or the mother of three black boys. Yeah. Something happened in my stomach. And I'll tell you what happened in my stomach, mom. Uh, so I'm a child psychologist. I work with families, uh, with children of all ages and children of all races. And I have the good fortune to have many conversations about this. And I will tell you, and I will say this because it's being broadcast, that there is no more difficult job in the world or in this country than to be the parent of a black boy. You have the most difficult job because of this, the thing that we're talking about because of racism, it is so much more difficult for a black boy in America to achieve his dreams, to realize his potential, because the thing that we call racism, which is an entire system that was built around making sure that boys with your boy skin do not thrive. The entire system of racism was built to make sure that advantages flow to people who are not black boys, to make sure that the benefits that are resources, that are wealth, uh, that the comfort of our society flow to people who are not black boys. And so the work that you're doing, I have a tremendous amount of respect for. And to your question as to like, why are people racist? Are they afraid of us? Um, the, the answer to that question is so complicated, but I, I just wanna say that people are racist because a system was built to maintain advantage to people with a certain kind of an, an identity at the cost or at the pain of people who did not have that identity. And so our, our racist system, because this, this goes far beyond the personal bigotry that makes us tired. This goes far beyond the individual racism that we experience when we walk into stores and have people change aisles in the supermarket um, and have people clutch their purse or get off the elevator on the floor that they have no reason being on because we're in the elevator with them. This goes beyond that personal racism that just makes us tired. This goes into the entire system that now warehouses boys that look like you in juvenile detention centers and adult prisons for reasons that boys who don't look like them, for reasons that little white boys never come into contact with police officers or the legal system. And so I don't know that it's just that they're afraid. I think it's just that they belong in a system that's been built over the course of hundreds of years to crush the hopes and the dreams of little black boys and little black girls and little brown boys and little brown girls. And so as I think about like, what do I do with your question? I really love all the energy that is building around this movement for anti-racism. And if, if you're out there listening to me and you have no idea right now what anti-racism, I, I, I encourage you to pick up a book, uh, you know, Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. It's probably sold out right now, but you can get a Kindle version. You can still get it electronically. And the, the idea behind anti-racism is this. There's so much pain created by racism. And whether or not you believe that you are a racist, whether or not you make this bone in my body, racism is still crushing people who don't have white identity. And you have to be on one side. You have to choose to live comfortably knowing that racism is killing your fellow man, or you have to take an act dance no matter what your color is, that I'm gonna work hard to interrupt racism, to dismantle racism, and to call out racism everywhere that I see it. And so to be anti-racist means that recognizing the pain that racism causes, if my family Thanksgiving dinner is gonna be uncomfortable because when uncle so-and-so starts up with his racism, I interrupt it and I speak out, and it doesn't matter that now everyone is uncomfortable, we're joining the discomfort of people of color who for hundreds of years have been calling out about racism. So to me, the question about how did pe pe be people become racist like, is, is a wonderful discussion to have. But honestly, where we are right now, a more important question that I want you to, to ask your friends, to tell your boys to start asking people is, 
What are you going to do about the fact that we now live in a racist society? Are you going to get on this bandwagon of anti-racism and disrupt it and dismantle it? Or are you going to simply opt out? Because you know what? I'm comfortable right now. For these answers and for all of the, the an answers that we've heard today, it's so great to be a part of addressing this thing that we are dealing with in this world right now, finally kind of dealing with it, hopefully, in a positive way. Um, I, I want to say, um, Dr. Waller, when, when you mentioned um, that this is an exciting time to be on the planet, I, I agree with you. I think that we are seeing this movement occur right before our eyes. And unfortunately, the tragedy, the tragic things that have had to happen in order to get all the, the attention that we're getting here is uh, you know, seriously unfortunate. But it is, it's a good time for us to be able to have these conversations. And it has certainly allowed for these conversations in a bigger way. And maybe that will lead to the change we need. Um, I can tell you from the man's perspective, um, this is a conversation we're very interested in having more of, but also, you know, not having a season means that we're not all, we're not able to offer the, the healing power of music that we would like to. We find ourselves in a very unifying situation when you're at the man under the stars and beautiful night like tonight. We should be there. We should be at the man right now. And, and because we're not, we're redirecting. And maybe this is a good thing right now that we're having this conversation um, and we'll get back to the man at some point. And I want to thank my colleague, Naomi Gonzalez, who's fabulous to work with. Um, for being such a big part of obviously this night and for just being great and doing her community engagement and education work is, is a great thing and part of why I came to the man. Michelle and the team from the Moors, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is great. Um, we have to continue. I, I think we could go on and on and I would love that. <laughs> so um, thank you all. Thank you very much, Michelle. First, I wanted to emphasize something that Dr. Harrison said, which, you know, I really hope one of the takeaways that our kids heard was that it's not you, it's the world that we live in. Um, and that's so important because I think one of the things that was uh, a reality, or I guess something that really resonated with me tonight was just hearing that these kids had some of the same questions that adults have, which I think is interesting because that means for black and brown kids, we've carried these questions our entire lives. And that's a whole different conversation in regards to the impact of carrying that type of burden starting at the age of six until you're in your 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, I think it's, an, it's, it's definitely a conversation about trauma and the impact that it has on your life. Um, but, you know, I really just want to thank the panel, you know, our partners at the Mann Center in Philadelphia, um, Dr. Waller, uh, my colleagues from the Moors, all of the parents that have tuned in um, to definitely help this conversation so we can stop the spread. There's so much work to be done, but this is a step towards progress. Um, our children are the future. So, you know, I think it's a joint effort. Um, together we can change the world. And while we as adults are focused on promoting the necessary change at our level, let's remember to keep those little minds healthy and safe. Um, you know, so what's next? You know, in the description um, that you have under this video, you will find a survey. So please let us know what you and your families want to talk about. Um, let us know if, you know, if we decide to continue this conversation, do you want to participate in the conversation? This is definitely not over. It's just the beginning. Um, so thank you from myself and the team at Nemours. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us this evening. For more information about resources available regarding this conversation and others, please visit kidshealth.org, the number one online resource for parents. Your child is our promise.